I tried to understand it as best as I could. So yeah, let's get started. So if you want to follow along, uh, just load Tidyverse, Skimar, and you can also load the beer data sets from a past Tidy Tuesday. So first, let's just go through some basics of functions. So just like vectors, functions are objects, and they have three main components. The first one being the argument, and if you have um, a lot of them, they're called formals. You have the body, which is everything inside the function, and you have the environment, which determines how the function finds the values associated with the names. And arguments in body are always explicitly mentioned, but the environment is usually implied. So here you have a function that I wrote. And if you want to check out the formals, you can call formals on this function and it'll just return the argument. And in this case, we just have one of them. So that's what it returned. And you can also call body to return everything that's inside the function. But you'll notice that when we called body, it did not contain the commented code chunk that I had over here. And that's because things like commented code chunks are considered attributes. So if you wanted to print all the body code along with all the attributes, you would call attributes on it and make sure to add source ref here to get the rest of the code inside of it. And another thing about functions is that you don't have to name them, um, especially if it just like takes too much effort to come up with a name or you don't think it's useful for whatever you're doing. And these are called anonymous functions. You can also put functions in a list and call them whenever you'd like, just as I did here. So if you're interested in what I did, I had a function for gallons estimation because one barrel is 31 gallons. Um, but if you want it to be more precise, it's actually like 31.657. So just a simple example. So you can also invoke functions if the arguments are contained in the data. So what I did here was pull the top three values for the total barrels variable. And I called the function on those top three values to convert the barrels to gallons. And that's what it did here. That's pretty cool. I didn't know you could do that. So you can also compose multiple functions and there's essentially three ways to do this. The first one is to nest your functions like so, but you can see that it quickly gets really hard to read. Or you can save the intermediate results as variables, but that's also kind of annoying and tedious. Or you can pipe them, which is by far the best solution here and the most readable. So another, now that we've got over the basics, another really important thing that the chapter goes over is if R is lexically or dynamically scoped, which is something that when I first read, I was like, whoa, like what, what is this? But um, it's a, these two are computer science terms and hopefully I'll do a decent job at explaining what those are. So here we have a function that intuitively returns 20, like that makes sense to me. But <laughs> what about if you have something a little bit more complex with a little more free variables? Um, when I first like sort of quizzed myself on what that would return, I got the wrong answer. I thought it was gonna return like this one because it was the latest one, but um, turns out it doesn't. And that has to do with how R works. So R is lexically scoped and we can try to unpack that a little bit. Like what is even a scope? So a scope refers 
to the places in a program where a variable is visible and therefore can be referenced. So my initial guess was um, what would happen under dynamic scoping. So that means it would call the most recent value assigned to that variable. Whereas with lexical scoping, it calls on things that are quote unquote, like within the, the scope. So again, R uses this lexical scoping. It looks up the values of names based on how the function was defined and not how it was called. And this lexical scoping follows these four rules. And I think if you spend some time to understand all of them, it will make the use of functional programming tools a little easier, hopefully. And also, if you ever anticipate down the line having to translate some code from other languages over to R, then that could be really valuable as well. So the first rule is name masking. So if you try to follow along with this function, it returns one and two, so these two, and not these two. And it has to do with the fact that these two essentially mask the first two up here. And if let's say you have a function and the name isn't defined inside of it, then R looks like one level up. So if you imagine that like we hadn't defined this, the Y to two, then this would have returned the Y up here because it would look one level up. And it does this um, every single time it can't find something. So it can go up all the way to the global environment and even the loaded packages. So I think the take home message here is that functions help you prevent mistakes by having variables only be valid inside the body of the function as much as it can. So something to think about. And if, if I'm wrong in any of my interpretations, please stop me and um, say something. You have a weird saying? opinion in beer? Did I, was that not wrong yet? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like IPAs were hyped so much and I just didn't get it. Like it just wasn't that good. And so it like fueled my hatred a little bit of them. <laughs> All right, so far so good, right? Is it, do I okay, cool. Let's keep going. So the second rule here is what's called a fresh start. So again, if you try to follow along here, um what it says is if like A doesn't exist, um give it one or else if it does, just add one to it. So I returned 420, which is 419 plus one as expected, because it does exist. And if you happen to run it again, you get the same thing. And that's because like each function run is completely independent of the other, like functions have no way of telling what happened before. So this is a behavior that you might want to modify and Hadley tells us how to do that in later chapters. But for me, like I don't see, I don't anticipate any case scenario where, where I would have to do this. Does anyone, does anyone envision a case where this would be useful? Cause I was wondering about that. Um. I do have a question. This is Pavitra. Um, so does that mean uh, that at the global environment, you cannot actually ever overwrite A because I mean, it did reassign the value back to A. So I'm just like, how, how would you change a global variable it, 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 within a function? I think you would have to like empty out the environment if you wanted to get rid of it and do it again, but I could be wrong. You can use super assignment, right? Oh. Yeah, the, the double arrow, uh, I don't think we've covered it, but. We, that's not, I think that's what Hadley means by we're gonna talk about this later. But if you do like two of these guys before the pipe, then it will scope one up. Gotcha. 
So the next rule is dynamic lookup. So R looks for values when the function is run and not when it's created, which like can be annoying because if you make a, a mistake in your code, you won't get the error message. But there's ways to um, to figure that out by using find globals um, and then manually emptying out your environment. But that's something that completely went over my head. So, yeah. So the next big topic. Wait, can you go yeah. back to that slide? Mm -hmm. I think it just means that like you can write a function, but it doesn't actually test any of the parts of that function until um, you execute the function. Yeah. Which is. Yeah. So I, I think that part made sense to me, but then I couldn't really follow along with the um, with the example he gave in the book. So maybe we could go over it and someone can talk through it. That would be really helpful. All right, so we have this. So you're talking about the G12 part? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you have like a really long script where you, at the global level, assign, I'm gonna run some, I don't know, I have some model I'm gonna run and I'm gonna ascribe these parameters at the global level. And then you run your function. And then later on, because, I mean, I know none of us would ever do this, but you give your parameters some generic name like X, C, Y. And then you're like, oh shit, why is this running differently now? It's because you wrote over that. I think that's what he's getting at. Like, imagine there's like a thousand lines of code between the first one and the second one. You'd be pretty perplexed as to why they're giving you different answers if that's because X, you've, you've given X different values. At least that's how I'm interpreting it. Yeah. Yeah, no, Maya, that makes a lot of sense. But then I don't understand how this helps you, like, detect it. Like, because the plus and the X, we, we did it here, and that's what we want our function to be. So. So I think, and anyone else can chime in here, it'll tell you what that function needs. And then you can like search within your code if you've assigned X to multiple things. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, it would, it would almost like flag it for you to further review it and see like, yeah, like if you, X. Okay. I, I guess I was reading it as like a debugging tool. Mm. But to Asme's point, Amaya, what I don't get is it has, you do have 20 that's been, I mean, you have, um, the value 20 that's been assigned to X. So in theory, there is no question of there being an empty or an unbound symbol. So I feel like her question is valid because it's already made an assignment, but then, and so then why would, like, I feel like this example is probably not the right example. I mean, I think because of the fact that there's also, there's, there has been an explicit assignment of X. I can see how you define this and you run it later and then you may not have X defined either in the global or in the local environment, and then you could flag it. But I think in this particular instance, I feel uh, like it would not be an error. Okay, this is one like my, I don't know, I want, um, I want Tyler to chime in if he's here, but I started playing with like promises and where functions are evaluated um, because this function is evaluated in the global environment. So it's looking to the global environment to find X. I don't know if that necessarily answers what you were getting at. Tyler. 
I'll probably liken it in another in like kind of a different more abstract way is to say like doing fine globals on a function essentially is like listing the dependencies of that function. So remember that plus is a function in itself and x is an object. So because it's not assigned as an argument of the function, nor is it assigned inside the function, um, it becomes a dependency that it depends on the global environment to have whatever the definition of x in order to run that function. So it also depends on plus, but plus is pretty basic, like C level, like it's a function, right? Like it, you know, you, it, it, you're not like defining it like base colon colon plus, but it's, that's sort of what it's doing, right? And X is like, because it's not defined as an argument of the function and it's not defined inside the function, it's a dependency on the global environment. So when you do find globals, it's telling you things that aren't, um, like things that aren't internally set of the function and things that are dependent elsewhere. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Tyler says you can parse the arguments in body and see that it depends on the symbol X, but the code tools function is unable to determine that variable was defined earlier than when it was invoked. I think that makes sense. Yeah, I'm just going through the comments. I just wanted to spend some time here because when you said you didn't like really get this section, I am sure that everyone is on the same page. Like you're not. <laughs> yeah. For that. Yeah. Yeah. That's I was. I was just. Things. Yeah. I. I. I thought this like fine globals would tell me exactly what the error is, like almost showing me the natural history of what happened to X during my, my project, but it actually makes so much sense to just see it as like, okay, your function is dependent on these, on these dependencies. Now it's on you to go check what they are. I think that's a, that's a succinct, simple way to. I wonder if like, it's a, it's situational or you're just a better programmer if you use x as an argument and like assign it within your function hmm. rather than leave it up to the global yeah i get i run into some problems when i do like a default argument if i'm trying to do like x equals x unless you force unless you explicitly tell it to do something else um if only because if you do it in like a package um it's reading from the package environment instead of from like the environment you made the function essentially um so there's there's environments is a, is a whole chapter in itself um but it's basically a similar idea where you know it, it's listing dependencies outside of itself mm -hmm. i guess the, the thing about this that i look at and think about is i would never define a function like this. I know you can without naming it and without, you know, the, whatever those braces are called, you know, but I, I would never do it because I guess I would want it to be more explicit than, than this. It just looks like it's, I don't know. There's a time and a place for anonymous functions though. Yeah, I guess. Like when we get to functionals and like map. Anyways, but, let's carry on, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll add, um, I'll add what we said to this slide to drive the point home for anyone that is tuning in later and is confused about this slide. So let's talk about lazy evaluation. So let's look at this function and see what it returns for f2 and it returns four. So what happened here is that the two got positionally matched to a and the function never actually uses the argument b and that's what lazy evaluation is about. 
So another example is if you ask it to print A and print B and you call F45. So it'll print A because again, A has been positionally matched to 45, but then it will throw an error for B. That's because B did not have to be evaluated until after you printed A. So lazy evaluation, like what we've seen, it's powered by what's called a promise. And a promise has three components. The first one is an expression, which gives rise to the delayed computation. The second component is the environment where the expression should be evaluated. And the third component is the value. And this ensures that the promise is evaluated at most once. And I think without like deep diving into promises, which I know like Maya is really into <laughs> right now, but I think for people that are maybe don't want to do that, I think that the take home message is that lazy evaluation is useful for when you want to include like a really computationally expensive step in your functions. And just knowing that it will only be evaluated when needed and when it does it will be evaluated at most once is that a correct statement that everyone agrees with okay cool so another thing about lazy evaluation is default arguments so Let's see here. My first function has two arguments, x and y. It sets result as x times y, and it prints x barrels equals to the result gallons of beer. So here I'm saying, okay, if I have eight barrels, how many gallons of beer do I have, knowing that one barrel equals 31 gallons? And it looks like it's done a good job here. This is correct. Now, you know that one barrel will always equal 31 gallons. So therefore you can set the Y here to be the default of 31. And when you call gallons eight, it will print the correct result. So here, when you use a default argument, the Y argument becomes optional, um, but just because you've set it as the default argument, nothing stops you from actually adding a Y that's different. It will still print the correct result. So you can convince yourself of that if you try it out in the console. So I guess, Tan, this is a good opportunity to talk about like the pitfalls of default arguments because I have a slide here that talks about it. So Hadley says, he doesn't particularly recommend them because apparently they can be hard to read and you need to know the order of evaluation to kind of predict what will be returned. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? Um, yeah, and the, the packages have their own environment as well. Um, so if you're defining something that's in a package, um, you know, it looks for like in a shiny app, for example, if I'm trying to pass the input object in or a session object in, um, I've been having problems trying to get to it. If I write the code in a, in a, in a package, because that's its own environment. Um, so it's just another complication of defaults is that it's looking like if I had like assigned the input object from inside of the shiny session, um, it would know where to look for it. But if you assign it from a package, it's looking in environments essentially. So um, it definitely gets more complicated if you do so. So I didn't take away that he was saying, don't use default arguments. I took away, he was saying, be careful with using default arguments that depend on other arguments to the same function. That's the way I read it. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, no, that's completely fair. Cool. 
So you can also use missing, which is very interesting to check whether an argument's value comes from the user or the default. So here, if you run this, it returns true because the argument's value does come from the default over here. However, it returns false when the argument's value comes from the user here. So I see this as like being useful for Shiny apps, but I'm not too sure of that. Because this seems like something that would be useful in like an interactive sense where there's an actual user inputting stuff. Is, is there an equivalent to also determining if um, an argument's value came from the local function environment or from a global environment? Like something like um, missing? Like is there an equivalent? I'm just throwing it out there, that's all. I think so. Like if you're like three functions nested deep or something, you could figure out exactly which function, you know, if it's two up or one up, like which argument or you know, which function you have run. I, I think you could figure that out probably by parsing like environments. Um, I guess that's the next chapter, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can circle oh, back on this. Um, I wonder if you can use prior um, and like the AST. Uh, Tyler put prior where. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, I know AST um, will give you like a cute little, the abstract syntax, syntax tree. It'll give you like where everything is located and what depends on what. So the dot, 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 which I had seen plenty of times, but never actually used myself, but I have a very, very simple, hopefully intuitive example here where I'm creating a plot and adding legend for the X axis and the Y axis. And you'll notice that these are not something that I had previously defined in, in my function. And that's what dot, dot, dot allows you to do, is allow, it allows you to add arguments uh, to your function that you hadn't previously done. So when is it used and when is it helpful? So it's used for when you wanna extend another function and you don't wanna copy the entire thing or when you're unsure of the number of arguments that you want to pass to the function. And I think that comes into play a lot for plotting purposes. Uh, the only thing to watch out for is any arguments after the dot, 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 like you must name them explicitly because they will not be uh, partially matched. So when it comes to exiting a function, you have essentially two options, right? Either it works or it doesn't. So when it works, it's, it means it's successful and it returns a value. When it doesn't, it throws an error. And there's two types of returns. There's implicit versus explicit and visible versus invisible. And this is very intuitive stuff. If you follow along with what I've done here is I've explicitly told my function to return the statement all good if the state is within this northeast vector that I created and if it's not return this and the the explicit um, the explicitness of this is because I've like said return whereas if you look at this function which is very similar the only difference is that I hadn't said return and that's that's what's considered like an implicit return then visible versus invisible. So in the first function here, you'll see that the output printed, whereas with here, when I wrapped it around invisible, uh, you don't see the output. But 
you can still you can still use print or wrap the whole thing in parentheses to verify that an output is still being generated. So to check if your function is actually successful or not. So errors are, I think, very useful, and I never made use of them, but I will start to do so now. And this is a function that I found online on calculating confidence intervals for a mean. And let's imagine this whole thing wasn't there before and you had run it. It would have thrown you an error message that is like not really comprehensible at all. But you can put these stops and these warning levels to sort of make it stop and print an error message that you're able to understand. And I think this, this could come really in handy for yourself, but also for when you're producing tools like a shiny app of, of any kind to put these things in place. So <laughs> I have this um, because I, like, I, I read this part on exit handlers like three times <laughs> and I still couldn't understand what the hell was going on. So if, I don't know, if, if we want to go through it together, I have the book here. If someone was able to understand what was going on and when this is useful. But if we don't want to do that, then we can table it for another time and I can try to wrap my, my head around this. My biggest thing with on exit is that if your code errors this part will still happen whatever's in on exit is that true that was my yeah. mental model that's that's my understanding too so like if you on exit print ipa suck your function failed but ipas will still suck um and then another thing that I actually also had a question about is the example I understand at a high level of like you're changing your working directory inside the function and then you want to set it back to the old working directory after getting out of the function. But it kind of broke my brain about the scoping because I thought you're in your own little world inside a function. Uh, but, but yeah, think about like if you were to call another R process, right, then, uh, and like, oh, maybe I'm confused now. I've definitely used on exit exactly like he described where you switch to a different directory and do something in that and then use on exit to make sure you switch back to your current directory. Um, and I've actually done that when like calling like, uh, like a Python script or something. Um, Interesting. So it, it's definitely come in handy. Uh, but yeah, I'm trying to call exactly why I did that. Yeah, I use it because um, to run the function, for example, if I'm calling like a stored procedure in SQL uh, from the server, I'll connect to the server inside, but on exit, whether it failed because of some kind of, um, whether for whatever reason it's, um, you know, the server isn't responding or something, I want it to like run a disconnect command. Um, so on exit, dis run db disconnect um, so it can do it. Yeah, sometimes I wish there were like um, just examples that like the example that you just gave of like disconnecting from from the server, I feel like I could wrap my head around why like an exit handler would be useful in that case. But like just trying to follow along this example, I just like couldn't understand the the use of it. Um, to Tyler's question about on exit, um, if you put a condition like an expression that fails and you use add equals true, it runs the next one. Even though even the though the first one failed. Self, not the function. That's cool. Yeah, so add equals true like doesn't overwrite 
So like add equals true appends to like the list of exit functions. Um, and then if your mm -hmm. first one fails, um, it continues to the next one. Okay. I still don't get it, <laughs> but it's okay. We can keep going. All right. So function forms, there are four types. The first one is prefix. I think that's the one we all know and use. We have infix functions, and those are most common in math operators and user-defined functions, and we'll see an example of that shortly. We have replacement functions that replace values by assignment, and we have special ones as well. So I think the take home here is that there are four forms, but everything can and should potentially be written in prefix form. So I, uh, uh, ask me, can you, can yeah. so the, the previous slide where you have that assignment operator, the, you know, the, the lesser than, is that a function, is that a replacement function or is that like, um, is that a primitive, um, you know, like the place where the names DF, you have the vector that's assigned to it. Like, is that assignment, is that a function or a, a primitive? Uh, I don't know what I know. I don't know what a primitive is. Uh, I think primitive is right, just uh, anything that's implemented in C code. I think it just there's an R wrapper yeah. for it. Maybe I'm, um, maybe I'm off on that. No, that's a, that's how I understand it. Um, and then I just ran the like question mark assignment. Um. And that is a base function. I mean, back on back in the section on invisible names, it, it says the most common function that returns invisibly is the assignment function. So it, it calls it a mm -hmm. function there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Thank you. So infix function R comes with a bunch of them. And I realize after this chapter that I'm going to, I'm not familiar with some of these. Like, I don't, I don't know about this one where you used two of them, although I've seen it before. This one we touched upon briefly during this talk. But yeah, I really like this part because it just gave me a lot to, to think about. And you can create your own, actually. So what I did was just that. And now you know my opinion about the best beer type, and it's sour beers. So. All right, replacement functions. So they act like they modify their arguments in place. And the way to set them up is you have the name and then the assignment sign. And they must have arguments that are named x in value. I don't think you could name them anything else. And they must return the modified object. So, oh, sorry. So here we replace the second one by five. Then you also have special forms, which I did not go over today. And in the chapter also goes over how to rewrite a function in prefix form. But all in all, this is what I consulted to help me understand these concepts better and hopefully if you are like me and still wondering about lexical and dynamic scoping and just functions in general, I think these references will be of use. So that's it. <laughs> that was awesome. This is a really long chapter and dense.
and I think yeah. you did a great job. Thank you. Um, do you guys mind if for the last 15, I share some of my ramblings and questions? No, not at all. Let me just go back to my screen. Uh, um, oh, stop sharing. Okay. So, some of these are more like discussion-y and then some, I don't know if we'll have time to do, but we can always like, I'll just introduce them and we can talk about it in the Slack channel. So first of all, um, the solutions manual has three questions in this chapter that were not answered. So if we could come up with answers for it, we can like submit a pull request and um, help them with their solutions uh, if we wanted to. Um, but my first question was kind of like newbie. Um, if you're gonna write your own, like let's say you know C and you wanna write a primitive function, do you just do that within R? Like what does that process look like? Uh, I think there, there's going to be a section on uh, C++. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's an interface, or maybe there is, between C and R directly. Uh, and I, if you do the C++, I think you can do that in RStudio with uh, like special syntax with the functions. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. All right, and then I'll just skip over the exercises now, but they're in this book down, the three. Uh, maybe we'll go back to them uh, if we have time. So I was curious, the book makes the distinction between parse time and runtime. What is the difference here? Is that like getting into promising, to promise world, I mean? I was I kind of interpreted that to be just another way to like set up the uh, lexical scoping versus dynamic lookup. Mm -hmm. I think it's talking. Of, I think it's the same thing. It's just a different way of saying it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wait, about past time and runtime. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, well. Um, so runtime is when the function is actually running. Right. At time, at, so at parse time, it will catch syntax errors. So it'll catch statements that are not well-formed R statements. But there are certain statements that are good R syntax that will fail. And you will only know that they fail at runtime. Like for instance, if, if it uses an undefined variable. I see. Okay. So if you have like some some operator that doesn't exist in a function and you define it, you'll get an error at pass time. But you know, if you use a if you use a variable that doesn't exist, you'll get an error at runtime. Okay. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, we talked a little bit about this example in the book where um, this G11 is always going to evaluate to one, but now I was trying, I wrote, I asked this question, like, how could we actually set it to two? And I think this is how you would, um, you would do that by just like using the super assignment here, or would you need to set a to G to this G11 function? Yeah, if you just define a line of a, assign one to a right above the g11 function, mm -hmm. that do the, that would be the trick. But okay, you uh, see the book, or the solution, you know, you assign the function to a. So then it does exist. Oh, yeah, I think that would work, yeah. What do you have there, it looks like it works. Yeah, so that's kind of 
something I was thinking of. And then we talked about this already, I think, but I wanted a more concrete example of like lazy valuation is good for when you have something uh, expensive and lazy valuation saves you from needing to evaluate that over and over again. But I was just curious if someone had an example of that. Maybe like if we go back to Tamron's database example, maybe you could like pass in the configuration for the connection to the database or it could okay. be a default option, but maybe it like takes three or four seconds to connect. Um, yeah. In, this case, in that case, it's like a timing issue, maybe not computationally expensive. But. That makes sense. Okay, um, this one I right. was hoping to, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I think another possibility might be that you have multiple potential expensive computations, but depending on some branching, you, you don't want to do all, but depending on some branching logic, you want to do one. Okay, so like if I have categorical variables, do a random forest. If I have this, do that kind of thing. Yeah, so I think, you know, because right, you don't want to do all your potential expensive computations. You just want to do the ones that, yeah. I'll keep thinking on a concrete example, but I like that train of thought for sure. Okay, I hope Tyler the robot will be able to chime in on this one. I went down a promise rabbit hole because coming like from a JavaScript world, this is not what they mean by promises here. Like I thought, they meant asynchronous um, computations, but ours weird. And I tried to like dig into this double function and Tyler came up with this where you're using that prior package that he mentioned to look at the promise info. Um, so if we just dig into this here, so we have, we're just like, creating little helper strings for ourselves along the way. And it shows you the code, the environment of the function, if it's been evaluated and the value. But I think he could speak to this far better than I can. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Sorry, Tyler, you're gonna have to participate in the Slack channel later. Everyone's gonna have to stay tuned for that. Um, and then I've been trying to like put all these words in a picture because that's how my brain works. And then on Slack, everyone's like, no, 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 abort. This is all wrong. What the hell are you trying to do here? Um, so working, working on that, Tyler, that's your homework. Thanks, cool. Um, then I had this other question where like, if we have this function f and we give it two arguments, but the function never uses y, we can then call f with some var variable that doesn't even exist and our function will not error because this promise never needed to be used. So we can just store promises in our back pocket. And I thought this was really cool but um, I wanted to think of a concrete example where we could leverage this behavior. I think maybe Arlang and all that wizardry might just hold on to promises without evaluating them until you need them. Um, but this is all just like super nerd tangents I've been thinking about. Um, no one has oh, I have a else. question, um, Maya. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you pass it as a function argument, though, I think that does not evaluate as part of the global environment. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there like the environment within a function and then there's the global and then what is passed, you know, whatever your pass by value or pass by reference, but that does not constitute 
the G, the var, var doesn't exist, is not within G. Am I right? Like it's not within global. Since it's an argument in a function. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I just like, honestly don't really know. I have to think about that. I can probably try and um, dig up something from Java. I don't quite know how R does it, but I could find a corresponding. I don't know. If yeah. be the same. I guess you could do some kind of like put a function in that doesn't want. So, like, if you make the first one, the first argument of a function lazily evaluated and never actually referenced inside your function, if you put it in a pipeline and you don't want it to actually do anything with the previous data, but you want to like output that data or something, you could like easily evaluate it and then like run a function like at the end of a pipeline or something. I'm not sure why you would do that, but yeah, <laughs> something in the middle of a pipeline where like you're, you're taking X in and then like you feed it X out or something. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I was just trying to come up with crazy Frankenstein functions. Um, Cool. Okay. This one confused me where you assign X to the LS function. This, this one makes sense to me, but why, like, why is, it talks about how, you know, evaluating this in different environments gives you different answers, but why? So like a list in the first case only looks within the function, and then a list in the second case is global. Okay. But, uh, yeah, honestly, I would have guessed uh, you know, in the function, uh, as a function argument, it would have looked in the global environment. Yeah, that was my, it kind of hurt my mental model, but I think that makes sense. It's not, I guess it doesn't evaluate till later in that function. So it's like, mm -hmm. uh, it's a yeah, delayed evaluation. Okay. I think yeah. yeah. Okay, we spoke about missing a little bit and then Hobley said, I would recommend using this way more uh, brief post function where we use null instead of missing. But I was wondering if that's just like Hadley being opinionated, if there's any downsides to using null instead of missing, and if anyone had any experience with that. Exactly. I mean, yeah, if it's Hadley's opinion, then I should just shut up and take it. I, I mean, no, I, I like using null. Um, yeah, well, he. He said it's like use normal like if you want to like indicate to the user that maybe uh, the function will define a default within inside if it's missing, whereas maybe you can't do that with the same. They're done. And uh, the second case I think was like with wrapper functions. If you write another function that calls that function, you can't pass like a missing something that it's missing to that that you can have. Okay. I think that makes sense. I'm happy with that. Next up, there was this little guy, and I have never seen this, the curly bracket assignment to Y, colon, what, can someone say in words what X is in this function? I feel like it should be two, because that's the last line and I think because there's no explicit return mm -hmm. like the curly parentheses don't they indicate a function anyway I, I don't know yeah. uh, Tyler says too it's an expression so so x is y is equal to one and then like colon is a new line yeah so Implicitly, you're returning two, so x is equal to two, but um, yeah, because I it's guess the last thing I, is two. 
Yeah. My question is, what, how, how would you say this expression in words? Like, why, you're assigning one to Y and returning to? Well, because the last statement without an explicit <laughs> return is always the return. Yeah, that I get. <laughs> but I, I, I just have never seen this, so I wanted to like put it into words. Um, I, and I don't know what a semicolon is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having a moment. <laughs> this just like encapsulates just my entire time with this book, but yeah. So how does y okay, equals that, to zero not overwrite y assigned to one though? Is there because that expression is only returning two? Or is that expression uh, is a mini environment? Yes, but then so then don't we assign a zero to y? So like would it not be zero two comma zero? Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's one. Okay. I think this is getting into those dangers of like the lazy evaluation and we're I think so. adding y to one. So y to zero is never going to happen because we already did y equals one. You're saying this is contrived, but I'm not having fun. Yeah, actually, I think that I, I think that makes sense, right? If you assign one, one to y, then it doesn't evaluate y equals zero because it already knows the value. It's like if you were to include the arguments y equals one, comma y equals zero, wouldn't it just do the first one? I I like Darren's explanation in the chat. He says the y equals zero default only applies if there's no y in the scope. But since there already is, that doesn't get used. Uh -huh. That sort of makes sense. OK. That, I'll, I'll let that one marinate. Um, this one's more of like a, just does anyone know? I didn't know how to Google this. Um, so we've been using like body, or you can just call a function in the uh, console and get it's the guts of the function. But I was curious if your function has methods like hist, how to go about like printing the actual code of what hist is. Does anyone know? Source. You'd have to look at the object you're calling hist on. So a method belongs to the object. Um, so I, I think it's like a tibble would have a hist method. Um, a data frame would have a hist method, etc. Yeah, I tried doing hist dot, I don't know, numeric or something, but maybe, but maybe that's not the right class. Uh, hist dot default. Oh yeah, there you go. Hist dot default. Cool. Sweet. Okay, learned something new there. Um. For dot dot dot, Hadley gives the identical uh, the uh, example of using list two, and then I wanted to look at what the hell list two is, and the example in the documentation is identical to a regular list. So I was wondering if someone had an actually helpful example. Are you passing a list another list? Something to play with. Moving on. Um, and I realize we're over time. You could, we could go if you guys want. Um, I'm almost done here. Feel free to leave if you have to. Um, and again, this is all in the book down if you want to just look it over yourself. I'll just carry on to myself here. Um, there was this example where x is equal to a list here. And then 
he writes, Alpi uses dot 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 to pass NARM on to mean. What? How? Where? I didn't really. That did. I think I'm missing something there. Um, I think it. Well, L apply is probably like a primitive, right? Uh, well, it probably. Is, he is this like he's saying mean L apply has dot 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 to add as many arguments as you want, and then after the mean comma, you can start adding arguments to the mean function? Yes, yeah. I believe that's what he means. OK. Yeah. That makes sense. On first read, it was intimidating. OK. Um, then I wanted to debug plot 1 through 10 call equals red, because one of the exercises tells you to and it did it just gave me this it didn't give me an informative anything so i don't know how to debug apparently thanks scott i'm copying and pasting that aha cool debug plot and then plot one through ten i will do that in my notes yeah i, I typically use browser more like a like a Breakpoint or something in like another language. Mm -hmm. uh, debug so once, say. Yeah, debug once. Debug once is like my favorite now. No one else reads that, like Beyonce. Okay, moving on. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, going back to the on exit hell. Uh, Odd. I kind of was answering my own question that I understand add equals true if you want to append a bunch of these. That was kind of my, um, I was struggling with that, but I just put it here in case anyone else was. Uh, and then if you don't add equals true here, you're just going to get B. Is that correct? Or would you just get A? If you add, if you put in add equals true, then you will get both message A and message B. Um, otherwise, you will only get message B. And then I think you had a question in there as well. Um, there is a reason to not use add equals true, and it's, it's if you have branching logic that has different exit conditions. Interesting. OK, this is. This is the one I, I tried, but I think we went over this a little bit, so I'll just struggle on my own, my own time here. I think it's a bigger question of me not understanding scoping with working directories because I get that you're setting your, you set some options, like uh, you could set your like plot margins or whatever, and then on exit, you want them to go back to zero. Um, I think that's kind of what's happening here. You want get working directory as a first argument or first function, not set. So get the get your your current working directory, store it as old, and then. Tyler says no. I copied this from the book. This is not Maya code. Because you want to return it back to your old directory, so you have to get the current working directory, then set it. That makes sense to me, but set returns the current working directory. Set, set really? Oh, yeah, it does. So, yeah, if you change directories, yeah, set returns like the same thing that you would get from git working directory. But it also. That was horrible changes. function naming. <laughs> But I mean, I guess it also does the, the, the action of changing directories. So it's like doing two and one. OK. Yeah, it's starting to make sense. Um, yeah. All right, this is another question that they had flagged as unanswered. Um, and then here, if anyone wants to really go over this, 
there's one of the exercises is to read the body of capture output and then write our own version. Um, the second function is more concise, but it doesn't do some of the, it doesn't have some of the features of the real capture output. So I don't know. I, I think I don't read enough um, source code. So I thought it would be fun to go over, but we're way over time right now. And then another thing is um, um, if someone could put this into English, I think that would be really helpful for me. Oh, so it's like showing the uh, like the reference. Yeah. With the temp stars. <laughs> I've never actually seen that before, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I think I'm like starting to get into, it, it's, it's new to me. So maybe we'll just look it over in our own time. Um, and maybe Tyler would help write something up because he's a robot right now. But he, he said yeah, he, that was it's new to him. So he doesn't, oh. wow, he doesn't know it, Tyler. No. <laughs> feel so much better than myself now. <laughs> that, temp function, that temp function that you were just doing was basically a custom created infix function, right? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. Do, or leads me to an interesting question. Every custom infix that I've made starts with percent. And I think I read somewhere that they have to. So what the hell is this? Oh, thing? okay. Okay, so wh where is this shown? Is this like, uh, was this like how they showed that this is what it translates to? Yeah, it's at the end of the chapter. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's an infix. Yeah, because I, I have, I read Sorry, this. Sorry, I, I just saw the, the back text no, and the I, definition I was thinking it was. I understand why you thought that totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the ampersand, I, it's probably just like a reference. To some, I mean, because that's what we learned before with lists. There, well, I guess it's a name vector, not a list. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Yeah, I don't know. So assign x into a temporary variable. Mm -hmm. Then call names of temp and then assign two into it. So that's actually a prefix form function, right? He's calling the pipe, the assigned function. So subset and then assign. Yeah, this whole thing is turning assign at the top there names. I think he's turning names into a prefix. Because it's, the, a, the it's part a kind is of like, special. Yeah. And that's, it's both the names prefix and the subset prefix. So it's like yeah. two of those special types. I guess my, my confusion was like, is that star temp, is that like just a random variable name you came up with for the example? Or is that like what it would actually translate to in some, I don't know, R? Also a good question. Weird, weird, weird. Okay. I'll let that one marinate more. And then this is a question that kind of like builds on that. And that is everything. So I'll try to collate all the notes that we took because we did answer a large bulk of these. Um, and then I'll like throw in the chat the ones that we didn't so we can discuss there. Cool. Thanks so much, everyone, for letting me ramble and go over time. This was a really dense one, but I learned a bunch. Great presentation. And next week is Darren, correct? Yep. I'll be here. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Good night.